At the beginning of the 19th century, the American West was still an unspoiled land which was only inhabited by Native Americans. This situation changed after 1803 when Louisiana was purchased from the French government. A group of men, commanded by Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, were sent to explore the area and open up a route which would allow the land to be settled. As the settlers occupied their land, so the stories increased of a strange place where bison covered the prairies and boiling water sprang from the rocks. In 1870, the government sent a military expedition to find this place. The tales they told on their return were so extraordinary that a new expedition had to be sent to ensure that what they said was really true. The first expedition had not exaggerated in the least. They discovered the fabled region and the lands of the Sheep Eater and Shoshone Indians right in the heart of the Rocky Mountains. The river that crossed it from north to south was in itself a wonder of nature. In its upper part, it formed the largest lake in the United States. Beneath this lake and after passing over an amazing waterfall, the waters flowed along the inside of a 32-kilometer-long canyon. Yellowish rocks flanking the river gave the region its name, Yellowstone. Coniferous forests covered 88% of the valleys and the mountain peaks climbed to over 3,000 meters. The region was a real natural paradise. The Rockies form the main mountain range of North America. This continent is moving towards the west and the pressure on the Pacific makes the Earth's crust fold, so creating these awesome landscapes. The formation process is not over yet. The northern part of Lake Yellowstone is rising at a rate of 24 millimeters a year. In 1959, an earthquake changed the course of the River Madison and created Lake Quake. This geological activity is what created the most fascinating of Yellowstone's landscapes. Something so incredible that John Coulter, the first white man to see it in 1807, or Jim Bridger in 1850 were branded as lunatics when they told their tales. A valley where mud bubbled, stones gave off smoke, and jets of boiling water spouted from the ground. Nobody in their right mind could believe such far-fetched stories. On seeing these landscapes, it's easy to comprehend why nobody believed these stories and that the Indians that inhabited these lands saw them as the place where evil spirits dwelt. In the park, the Earth's crust is only five kilometers thick as opposed to an average of 50 kilometers in North America as a whole. This layer is so thin that the heat from the magma below it reaches the underground waters. The temperature rises in some cases to over 100 degrees centigrade, and when they find a way out, they appear on the surface as fumaroles and geysers. Yellowstone has the largest and most varied range of geysers in the world. Life is also possible on these waters. 
The surprising colors of these waterfalls are not due to the nature of the rock. In fact, they are caused by tiny algae and bacteria. Each species can withstand different temperatures, so they do not live in these same pools. The most resistant are in the upper part. As the water goes down and gets cooler, the weaker ones can find shelter. Conditions in the rest of the park are much more favorable for life, and this goes on in great profusion. The prairie dogs live in open spaces. Their burrows dug out underground are like real cities spreading across the plain. In Texas, at the beginning of the century, a study of one such burrow discovered that it covered more than 60,000 square kilometers and had 400 million inhabitants. Wherever they settle, they systematically destroy the prairie. Over time, the tall grass disappears and only the most resistant to grazing is left. This has two advantages for prairie dogs. Low grass is their favorite food, and low grass also enables them to spot coyotes with sufficient time to get away. The best times for the coyote began after the gray wolf was eradicated in 1930. But in 1995, the park was resettled with gray wolves and the coyote had to give up some of its territories to this more powerful competitor. One of the reasons which led to the reintroduction of the wolf was to control the population of North America's second biggest cervid, the wapiti, or elk. During the summer, there are herds of almost 30,000 elks, and this puts far too much pressure on their grazing areas. At this time of the year, they divide up according to sex and spread across the open prairies. Their antlers, which they had lost during the previous winter, will be ready again for the autumn, when the mating season begins. The wapitis are the most polygamous deer in America, and their harems may reach 60 females per male. The Rocky Mountain Mouflon is much rarer. There are only a few isolated groups in the highest peaks of the mountains. Only 150 of these animals live in Yellowstone. Their capacity for walking on rocks and their resistance to the cold allow them to inhabit the steep mountain peaks. Here there is no competition from the other large herbivores. They only share this area with their predators. Pumas, coyotes and eagles are all prepared to reach these heights to hunt them. The pronghorn, the fastest herbivore in America, lives in the open spaces. It can reach speeds of 80 kilometers an hour, and its heart is twice as big as would normally correspond to its weight. Its feet are similar to a giraffe's, and although it sheds its horns, it only loses the outer layer, which falls off when a new one grows beneath it. Its peculiarities do not end here. In order to adapt to temperature changes, they can vary the angle of their fur. When it is cold, their fur sticks close to their skin, and when it is hot, it sticks out, allowing air to circulate around the fur. Control over their fur has another important use. 
When they sense they are in danger, they stick out and flatten the white fur on their haunches intermittently. The change produced by the reflection of light can be seen four kilometers away, more than enough for the herd to reach safety. The pronghorns share the prairies with the legendary bison. Both species have different diets, so they do not need to compete and can live together in peace. In the past, millions of these colossal animals roamed North America in search of the best pastures. Today, their migrations are limited to the Yellowstone area. In the summer, they graze on the high plains and they come down to lower areas during the harsh winter. Males and females form separate groups and come together during the mating season in July and August. They can also be seen together in spring and autumn when they meet up in search for the best pastures. The bison played an important part in Indian culture. It provided them with food, clothing, and even materials for their tepees, their famous tent houses. Every year after abandoning their winter quarters, the Indians sent out scouts to look for the bison. Once they had been found, the tribe moved to this area and after carrying out ceremonies so that the spirits would make the mission a success, they prepared for the hunt. Everything changed when the white man arrived. The totally unscrupulous settlers hunted the bison indiscriminately. The railway magnates of the North Pacific saw this as the way to get rid of the Indians that opposed the railway. Huge slaughter took place. The businessmen achieved their objective, but the massacre did not stop there. Killing bison had become a very profitable fashion. In the railway's publicity leaflets, passengers were offered the possibility of hunting bison without even leaving their seats in the train. The slaughter continued for almost a century. During the most intensive period, the dead bison were just abandoned and not even their tongues, which were considered a great delicacy, were collected. There were so many corpses littering the prairies that businesses were created to retrieve the bones to make fertilizers. When Alvar Núñez Cabeza de Vaca made this drawing in the middle of the 16th century, the North American bison population was over 70 million strong. By the end of the 19th century, only a few hundred remains scattered around. In 1920, there were 50 bison left in Yellowstone. Only then did people realize that the species had to be protected. Today, there are over 3,500. In the middle of July, the mating season begins. In contrast to other herbivores, the bison do not group harems together. When a male detects a female on heat, he begins to follow her and wait for the right moment. Whew. 
Each female is only receptive for 24 hours, so the male cannot let her out of his sight. If he does not mount her in this time, he will lose his chance until the following year. Any male may participate in the procreation process, but those under four years of age have little chance. They are too weak to take on older rivals in a dispute over a female. Also, they are socially inferior to the females, so they are unlikely to be accepted as mates. After the mating season, the group separate and life returns to normal. The bison graze at dawn and dusk and spend the middle of the day resting, ruminating and having baths of earth. In the time of the great herds, hundreds of bison could be roaming about at the same time. They kicked up so much dust that on some occasions these dust baths were mistaken for forest fires. The birth of the young does not happen until the following spring after nine months gestation. The females leave the group and give birth to a single infant. After half an hour it is able to stand and after a few hours it can walk. A few days later both of them rejoin the herd. The characteristic hump and horns do not develop until they are two months old. During this time, the mother continues feeding the infant, which will not be weaned until the end of the summer. The youngster stays with its mother until it reaches sexual maturity. Then it must leave the group and join the males. The first snows appear when winter arrives. The temperatures have fallen. Summer temperatures may reach 30 degrees centigrade, but in winter the temperature rarely gets above freezing. At night, it may fall to 50 degrees below zero. The snows cover the pastures and it becomes more and more difficult to get to them. The blanket of snow gets larger and larger during the winter and may be over three meters thick. In the mountains, the lair is even bigger, 10 meters of snow. This is definitely the hardest time of the year for the local fauna. Many wapitis die during this period. The survivors go to the northern region of Yellowstone which is the lowest area and almost the only place where it's still possible to graze. They are not the only ones. The bison have also arrived here.
These impressive bovids are better prepared to face the hardships of winter than the elks. Their summer fur has disappeared. In its place there is a dense layer of fur several centimeters thick which covers them completely and isolates them from the cold. At last spring arrives. The snows melt and a new cycle of life begins. The increase in temperatures brings electrical storms and forest fires. Every year the region is hit by several forest fires which are put out by the spring rains. The most serious fire on record occurred in 1988. 470,000 hectares of land went up in flames before the fire brigades could put it out. Yellowstone had lost a third of its forests and many animals had died. However, these catastrophes are a part of the natural cycle. Fire is fundamental for the regeneration of the forest. The burnt soil receives sunlight for the first time in many years. Seeds may shoot, and this process is helped by a layer of ash which is rich in nutrients for the plants. In just a few years, new trees will have replaced the previous generation. Yellowstone was declared a national park in 1872, a year after the second expedition was sent to confirm its existence. 9,000 square kilometers of unspoiled land acquired for the first time in history a new legal status, the objective of which was conservation. The way forward was not easy. Both public and private initiative put the interests of tourism before the protection of the ecosystem. In 1930, the grey wolves were exterminated in a campaign against park predators. The reason given for this was that they killed the large herbivores, which were the main attraction for visitors. Effective measures to protect the park only started to be taken in the 1960s. Today, hunting is forbidden and only 5% of the total area of the park is open to visitors. After two centuries of barbarism, the spirits of the Shoshone Indians may rest in peace. Their dwelling place has become sacred territory once again, a paradise which at last has come to be respected by the white man.